The Ford Tabor Ford Rodman Historical Association, in conjunction with New Bedford Cable TV, is bringing you a series of interviews with local citizens that we are labeling Heroes Among Us. These are individuals who have experienced the trauma, the confusion, and the drama of war. My name is Joseph Langlois. I'm president of the Fort Tabor Fort Rodman Historical Association. Those seen in this series are ordinary individuals who were confronted by extraordinary events that demanded at times more than they may have thought they were capable of enduring. They experienced situations that were impossible to imagine in civilian life. Some of those interviewed participated in historic military engagements, while others were often involved in conflicts that were kept from the public from ye for years. We will not be discussing strategies or outcomes, but rather take a more focused, a more personal, and a more intimate account of events. We've decided to commit ourselves to this work, as history is often easily forgotten, distorted, or placed in well-written books, once read, that may never be taken off the shelf again. Most often, the roles of thousands of seamen, soldiers, airmen, and officers are often lost in time. Our hope is to preserve their memory, record their experiences, and allow others to learn from the bravery, the courage, and the indefinable spirit that mankind is capable of during periods of intense stress of the type that is often encountered during war. Vice President, Mr. Speaker, members of the Senate and of the House of Representatives, Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. December 7, 1941, the Japanese positioned six aircraft carriers northwest of the Hawaiian Islands. Early Sunday morning, 352 Japanese planes, fighters, bombers, and torpedo planes were launched in two waves to attack the military targets in Oahu. The damage they caused was substantial. They sank four aircraft carriers, damaged four more, damaged three cruisers, three destroyers, a mine layer, and a training battleship. They also destroyed 188 aircraft, 155 were damaged, but the most significant losses were the losses of the servicemen during that day. 2,402 servicemen were killed, 1,247 were wounded. There were also 57 civilians killed and 35 wounded. Japanese losses were relatively light. They lost 64 servicemen. One Japanese sailor was captured. 29 planes were destroyed and they lost five midget submarines. Their goals in attacking Pearl Harbor was to severely damage the Pacific fleet so they could not interfere with their immediate plans to invade Malaysia, the Dutch West Indies and the Philippines in their search for the natural resources of oil and rubber. They also hope to demoralize the American public from going into war in the Pacific by the sinking of the prestigious U.S. battleships. Unfortunately, their goals were not met. The attack on Pearl Harbor galvanized American public opinion in favor of the war. Support of isolationism disappeared almost overnight. And while the attack caused tremendous damage, they failed to attack the dockyards, the oil depots, or the machine shops which allowed the United States to repair 
the majority of the damaged ships. In addition to that, the Pacific Fleet aircraft carriers were not at Pearl at the time. This proved very vital six months later in the Battle of Midway. From 1942 to 1947, all of the ships, except for three battleships, were repaired and returned to active service in the U.S. Navy. The three ships that were lost were the Arizona, the Oklahoma, and the Utah. On 12-8, the United States declared war on Japan. On 12-11, Germany and Italy declared war on the United States. Today, we're going to be talking with Manuel Martin, who is a member of the U.S. Army, and his duty was coastal artillery on the island of Oahu. I was born and raised right here in West Point. Okay. On a farm. And we were working one day, my brother Joe and I, and uh, I don't know what brought it on, but I told Joe, I said, you know something, Joe, I'm going to join the goddamn army. What was well, his reaction to that? You're kidding. <laughs> he kind of laughed, but uh, we were hoeing corn. I dropped my hoe right there. Mm -hmm. And I went to the house, and my mother was there alone. My father had a cheese business, which is still in business today, okay. and long after he's gone. And he was out doing his work. So we had kind of a free wheeling when he wasn't around. So I told my mother, I said, uh, Ma, I'm going to join the army. Oh, she kind of grinned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She didn't take it seriously? Uh, so, no. Okay. No. So, my bedroom was upstairs. I went up there and I put on some clean clothes and whatnot. And uh, didn't say anything. I walked back outside. I walked to the garage where we had a car, and the keys were all was left in the car. So that was no problem. And I got into it, and I don't know, I guess she was surprised I drove out, because we lived in a long lane, six tenths of a mile long into the woods, which it's only right over here. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the pond is, yeah, our farm went to the Vol Pond, and on that end, and now I live, the vault pond is only a, a stone throw right over here. Okay. I live on the opposite end. So now. tell us about what you did next. So, anyway, I, uh, I got into the car and I went to Pleasant Street in Fall River. There was a small recruiting station there. Mm -hmm. So I went in there and I told the guy I want to join the army. So, all right, sit down. So, uh, what branch of service are you trying to get into? I said, I'd like to get into the air car. Oh yeah, I can put you into the air car. I said, there's only one thing though. I want to go to Honolulu. <laughs> Honolulu is something that I had, you know, because it was beautiful. Yes. And that's what I told my brother Joe. I'm going to Honolulu. So, yeah, he looks through his thing. Well, I can put you in the air car, right, anywhere in the country, but I cannot put you in Honolulu. Well, that kind of disappointed me. But I said to myself, I've come this far and gone away. I said, I asked him, what's the next branch, branch of service? Well, we all know that air car is number one, coast artillery is number two. I said, all right, can I get into the coast artillery? 
and looks for his papers? Yes. I can put you any damn place you want to go. So I said, can you put me in Honolulu in the Coast Guard, at Coast Artillery? <coughs> he said, yeah, I can put you in Honolulu. I said, I'll take it. That was on the 3rd of April. On the 8th of April, they marched us all outside and bring all your gear and everything else. And they load us on trucks. And I don't know where the heck we went, somewhere in Boston. And they, we got out. <laughs> that was a funny thing too. I'm, there's a pile of us, and I'm standing right out in the front. And there was a civilian man, he was in charge, he was taking over. And he looks at me and he said, you're a farmer, aren't you? I said, yes, sir, I'm a farmer. He said, I can tell one when I see one. He said, you mind doing a little work? I said, no, I worked all the time. Right behind him was a, the biggest forklift I ever saw. So he pointed at the forklift. He said, you operate that thing? I said, sure. All right, he said, put your stuff right there. He said, and you take that forklift, and you see that he pissed off the damn warehouse was just full. He said, you bring that right over here. And there was two civilian men next to the ship, and they put down a big rubber mat about as big as this table. He said, you put it right on top of that mat. I started it up and I started. The winch in the ship was coming down and mm. picking it up, putting it on the ship. And I stayed there, I don't know, a couple hours running that thing. When I got done, I parked it and there was a man waiting for me right there. He said, okay, he said, that was a good job, come with me. And he took me on the ship and we went down one deck and right there in the middle, he said, there's a bunk for you. Oh, so uh, you got a choice bunk. <laughs> I got a choice bunk, yeah, right. <laughs> for my little, my little labor. But uh, we left there and, you know, I was in seventh heaven and kind of blinded at what was going on. But a lot of guys were sick. I was not sick. I, I enjoyed it. Right, so we you, went. Okay, you tolerated I, the ocean ride well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I saw Florida, went close by Florida, and saw a few other things. And then the Panama Canal, yeah. which was a hell of a, uh, you know, I was, I was dumbstruck. Yeah, I'd never been. Well, kind of special for a farmer yeah, from West Yeah, Britain, I'd huh? never been further than Fall River from, yeah. from home. Yeah. And here I am, and God only knows where I'm at. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the Panama Canal was quite an experience. And what kind uh, of a ship were you in? It was a strictly a passenger ship. Okay. Uh, the USS America. So it was an ocean liner. It was an ocean liner. It was okay. a big one. Yes. Yeah. So, so we went to California and we stayed there a couple of days <coughs> and we just wandered around and had a good time. That was the first time I'd ever I'd ever seen a uh, burlesque show. <laughs> oh, really? First time you've seen a burlesque oh, show? Oh, yes. Right. <laughs> yes. Walking up and down the street and running to a couple of the guys and uh, I'm looking at the posters. Uh, what the heck is this? So the guy said, come on, let's go in. <coughs> so I went in and it turned out to be a burlesque show. I didn't know that's what it was. Mm -hmm. But I was getting an education right then. Uh, we stayed, like I say, two days, I think. And then 
off Guadalupe we went. We end up in right in Honolulu Harbor, a beautiful spot. Yeah. I'm sure. I uh, I'm sure. I can never for, never forget the first thing we could see was the Aloha Tower. And it's still there today. And uh, that's supposed to be a welcoming sign. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Honolulu. Now, what was your assigned duties? I, I, uh, I run a diesel electric power plant, and I was in charge of all the telephones in our outfit. We had 52 telephones because we were a 12-inch outfit. Oh, you had 12-inch artillery pieces? Yes. Okay, that's substantial. And so yes. there was one over there and one over there, and inside the fort was a plotting room with about 20 guys, mm -hmm. and each one of them wore a telephone, yep. and the battery commander had a telephone, and I had a telephone because I was running the diesel electric power plant, okay. and uh, uh, I had 52 telephones that I was in charge of. And now were those 52 telephones uh, simply between those two guns, or did you have other? Uh, the two guns, the plotting room, and the powerhouse, and whatnot. Okay. We did not, could not contact outside. Okay. Although I, in the power plant, I did have a telephone that would contact outside. Okay. But all the others, no, they were just strictly in there. A lot of people don't know how you fire a 12-inch gun or a 14-inch gun, mm. but you don't just pull the trigger and well, shoot what it. Tell us a little bit about how it is done. How it's done? Uh, tell us uh, about that 12-inch gun and, and yes, what's involved a, in firing it. Uh, in order to control a 12-inch gun, well, we had two of them, like a battery. We had four outposts. Them outposts were on the highest peaks in Honolulu. One was at, right at the entrance, one was right behind Honolulu on a high mountain, and then one was behind uh, Pearl Harbor. On, that was the highest. I forget how many hundreds of feet that was up in the air. But that was my job. I had to maintain all them phones. And of course, every one of them, there was five men in each one of them stations, okay. and they, uh, everyone had a telephone. And their job was? Their job was to spot anything. They could spot anything 42 miles at sea. And the minute they saw a speck on, out there, now they watched it. And if they couldn't identify it within a certain period, they would let the battery commander, who would let the outfit, and we'd get the guns ready to fire. Yeah. Now this becomes important because at uh, Fort Rodman, we had two 12-inch guns too. Oh yeah. So it was somewhat similar and in a very yeah. large battery as well. Yeah, yeah. How long would it take to load and fire a 12-inch gun? Oh. Once we you know, we were set up continuously. We was on the let continuously. I don't believe it would take five minutes to okay. get a round out. Yeah. Yeah, it, was, it was done very easily. Right, and how many men uh, were needed to manage the gun? Uh, gee, on the gun crew, I think there was about, besides the commander, I think there was about eight men okay. uh, on each gun. And they all had a specific job, and the the ammunition, of course, was stored in the fort way back in a solid concrete area there. Yes. And uh, uh, they had a what they called a shock truck. The two men would push it, mm -hmm. and there were men in there 
with chain falls hoist up the projectile right. and the powder, they'd take it in sacks and put it on, on a tray. They'd put five packs on a tray. How two, large, how large were the shells? Twelve inch. Um, how tall were they? To give they were, the viewers some uh, idea of how yeah, large they were these. close to five feet, like there. Yes. And how much powder would be used? Uh, per two hundred and seventy-two pounds. Two hundred and seventy-two pounds of gunpowder. Yeah. yeah. How far yeah. could it uh, shoot that projectile? Oh, uh, I don't know. I think it. I think it was good for twelve miles. Yes, that's about the that's about the range of the ones down at Fort Rodman as well. Yeah. 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 Now. That kind of artillery, that's primarily against ships. Oh, yes. Yeah. That would not be effective against planes. No. 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 Okay. They had a, they, each one of them, there, there was two of them, uh, had a 75 millimeter cannon mounted on top of it. Okay. Now, if anything close by, they could fire that thing in two seconds, they could fire that thing. Okay. But, Anything offshore, then it was the big gun. Okay. Dawn, December 7, 1941, the Pacific Ocean. A Japanese task force was also heading for Oahu. Mission, sneak attack. Primary targets, Pearl Harbor and Hickam Field. Exactly at 0600, the fateful signal was given. And the first wave, 200 fighters, horizontal bombers, torpedo bombers, and dive bombers roared off. Pearl was an ideal target because through greater fear of sabotage than air attack, ships and planes had been brought together rather than dispersed. When the B-17s from California finally approached the island, their engines were heard by some of our men at Pearl and Hickam. At the same instant, from another direction, the Japs struck. I don't think I'll ever forget it. It was a, it was a gorgeous day in the morning. And uh, I was slated to go on guard duty. And I was a little upset about that. I didn't like guard duty no more than the next guy liked mm -hmm. it. But uh, that meant I had to get up. It was pitch dark. I had to make early chow. So I got up and got dressed when you, you had to put on a clean uniform mm -hmm. with a tie and everything to go out and save God do it. So I had gone in and uh, into the latrine and I had shaved and showered and everything else. And I just coming out and there were two guys standing out there. And all of a sudden, I see an airplane going by with this torpedo longer than the plane. What the hell is that? So, and the guy said, geez, I never seen nothing like that before. Well, right behind it was a zero. So, I looked at that. I said, God damn you guys, them are jacks. The minute I saw the zero, I recognized mm. that right away. Right. So, uh, oh, you're crazy. And they, didn't, then, they didn't believe you? No, no. Yeah. Then pretty soon, you can bang, and bang, 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 you could hear all this shooting and uh, hear that torpedo go off, you know. And pretty soon there's another one, you know. And I said, uh, Jesus, I said, you know, we're at war. And uh, I said, I gotta go to the guardhouse. So I run like heck across the street. And uh, I never forget this guy too. He was a hell of a nice guy. Captain, you know. Now, I didn't like guard duty during the day. And the officer didn't like it a damn bit better. You, know? you wouldn't think so. They didn't act that way. but. Captain Skipper told me the same thing. God damn.
same God good he said, <laughs> you know. And he, he was a hell of a regular fella, Captain, Captain Skipper. So, yeah, I said, uh, what the heck are we going to do? And he got on the phone and he was talking to somebody. He said, where it was, that's the Japanese, they're attacking Pearl Harbor. That put a different light on everything. Before that old outfit was out, what could we do about it? We couldn't do nothing about it. What I mean, them planes uh, stayed over the water. We couldn't shoot at them. No, not had that 12 inch we, gun, you couldn't, right? No, we had no way of doing anything. We did have, uh, uh, between our outfit and the fort, it was about three miles away, uh, we had um, three three inch anti aircraft guns. Yes. And we had them going. And uh, they were banging away. And we had a plane come in there and crashed, come right over one of the barracks, took the top off of a tree there and crashed into our uh, machine shop. Uh, I did take a little piece off of that airplane and uh, it's in the battleship down here. USS Massachusetts? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is, that, is yeah. that what it is, or Massachusetts? It's the Massachusetts, the battleship yeah. Massachusetts. Yeah. Well, it's it's down there on a on a bulletin board okay. with a little card and a little piece of Japanese airplane. Okay. I had taken that off an air, off of the zero we shot down, and I carried it in my pocket all the time I was overseas until I finally decided someday I'm going to lose it. I put it down there. Okay. America lost three destroyers. Here are seen the United States destroyers Downs and Shore as they rest on the bottom of Pearl Harbor with decks awash after Jap bombers make direct hits on their decks. First to feel the sting of Japanese steel are the USS Oklahoma and Utah, the latter a 33-year-old target ship. Accurate hits by the enemy bombers make short work of these two naval bulwarks. Now, with their keels practically out of water, they lie helpless wrecks and a sad reminder of cowardly strategy. Uh, we didn't get nothing to eat, and we didn't get much sleep either. Mm -hmm. uh, we had no barracks left. They blasted the heck out of our barracks and, and mess all and the whole works. I don't think I ate for a day and a half. Finally, there was a truck come down and had kind of a portable kitchen on it, and he made us something to eat. You know. Were any men from your unit lost as a result of these uh, attacks? Uh, yes, they were. I don't know how many there were, but uh, there was a few. Uh, I got to, uh, well, I was down. We, we were told to go down to the, uh, the Pearl Harbor Channel. Our company street went straight out into the Pearl Harbor Channel. Mm -hmm. And it went about halfway. It went close enough. Ship gone by. I used to, I used to bring grapefruit or anything. The trees were loaded, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd have as many as I could carry. And as the ship went by, I just toss them to the guys, you know, on sure. board ship, <laughs> uh, just for the fun of it, something to do. But uh, no, it was a, like I said. A toss away, right? Yeah. Now, when did you get a chance to go down to the harbor? Uh, I went right on December 7th. I yeah. went, I and went could down. you tell us your impressions of what it yeah. was like there? Well, it, uh, there was a lot of commotion going on, but uh, I didn't know. It was, uh, everybody was in shock and yeah, didn't know what the heck we were going to yeah. do next, you know? Yeah. I 
off the ship, that's all you could see was fire and smoke. Mm -hmm. You see some of them uh, trying to get out. Yes. Uh, the Pearl Harbor Channel is very, very narrow. Right. And uh, if you don't stay in the middle of it, with like a battleship, you're going to hit bottom. <laughs> and of course, there is a this big dock that our company street went out to, went out to the middle of that. You had to skirt that before you could get out. Yeah. What were some of the sounds like that you heard when you were down at uh, Pearl Harbor? <laughs> I heard an awful lot of uh, bombs going off. Yeah. And. Uh, a steady roar of machine gun fire. Yeah, there was uh, so many airplanes, you wonder where the hell they all come from. You know? And uh, we finally, I guess the Army got a few of, the, of ours up, and they were mixed up in them. And, uh, I think it was a little late by the time they got the biggest part of the damage was done. Already done. A lot yeah. of the planes had gone back to their carriers. What was the smells like? I mean, there must have been a, a uh, kind of a the smoke. Acrid. A lot of the smoke. smoke and the oil. Yeah, you know. yeah. And the water was nothing but oil. Yeah. It had a big slick on top of it. And uh, I think about a million life jackets floating up on the tide, you know. Yeah. And different stuff like that, and a couple of ships uh, that were grounded, kind of laying on the sides yeah. a little bit. And, uh, Pearl Harbor Channel took an awful shellacking. I it don't, did. I don't yeah. care how they put it. We took an awful shellacking. Yeah. yeah. And I like. I look at it just as an individual. And what did I know? I knew nothing. But uh, all I know is that we took a beating yeah. and couldn't do nothing about it. Yeah. The once mighty Arizona now rests on Pearl Harbor's muddy bottom, a pitiful relic of its former self, a grim monument to the treachery of Japan. The once mighty dreadnought's armor plate is twisted and torn, but the great battleship's control tower still stands, a defiant beacon that in days to come will cast its shadow upon Nippon's very shores. At Pearl Harbor, at Hickam Field, in the bomb-pocked streets of Honolulu, ever is written history. History with a tragic, treacherous pen. History that 130 million Americans will never forget. What were you assigned at, by the rest of the day and days following that attack? What was generally your assignment? Uh, just God duty. That's what everybody done. Yeah. And where would you be doing this, God? Uh, right there on the beach, and next to the next to the channel. Our biggest thing was to make sure nothing come into Pearl Harbor that we didn't know about. Mm -hmm. you know, we had our own ships; we could identify them, and of course, we had four outposts that were experts on this right. thing. And they were, they were reporting in all the time what was coming or what was going out. But uh, uh, no more enemy ships trying to get in that I ever saw. Now, was there a fear that there would be another attack? Oh, yeah, yeah. We expected it, but it didn't happen, no. which I guess was a good thing. So what was the the general, you know, feeling, the thinking that was going on amongst the men uh, uh, about all of this? Yeah. Well, everybody, I guess, felt the same way we are. What the hell are we in? Beautiful place, and now we're at war. And no. Everybody uh, were preparing to go to war, mm. which was lousy. Right? Well, it is, yes. Yeah. Now, have there been any talk before um, December the 7th that uh, there might be a war with the Japanese? Uh, was that part of the scuttle? Not but before of it. Not before of it. There hadn't been anything like no, that? No. 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 We, we always looked at the Japanese as our friends. Mm -hmm. Hey, Pearl Harbor's got a 
million of them, you know. Right. I, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah it's I a run, very uh, ethnic, I run into them, and yeah. racially mixed area. Yeah, working people. And, right. Uh, I went out with Japanese girls. They were beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, even uh, I was even taken home by a Japanese girl, me, their mother and father. Mm -hmm. They were nice. I didn't find nothing wrong with them. Yeah. They were very nice. Did your feeling about the Japanese uh, change after the attack? Uh, yeah, yeah, it uh, made me a little mad that, you know, uh, we treated them very nicely. And now, all they were doing was preparing, preparing to kill us all and yeah. take over the place. You know? Yeah, yeah that, that was a strong feeling when a lot of the guys just could not stand seeing one around, you know. I know I've spoken to men that even years after the war, they still held a lot of bitter resentment towards yeah, the Japanese. Yeah, well, uh, no, I never, uh, I never befriended any, or went out of my way to befriend any or anything like that. But, uh, hey, that was. That was the Japanese way of life, mm -hmm. and nothing we could do about it to change it. Except, except what we've done, take everything away from them. And well, ultimately, that, that's what happened, that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Well, you know, it's just like taking their food away from them. It ain't going very far, you know. Yeah. We took everything they owned. And I'm glad it turned out that way. Mm -hmm. uh, we could still be wrestling with them. <laughs> I don't think I uh, created any miracles or anything, but I, I never was faulted for not doing my job anyway. I, all right, Mr. Martin, thank you very, very much for yeah. allowing us in your home yeah. and telling us about your experiences it's during a, December 7th. It's nice to have you. And you never forget it. But oh, I, I, can, I can't see how you could. No. What you have just seen and heard is an account of a local citizen as he experienced the trauma of war. The goal of the Fort Table Fort Robin Historical Association in conjunction with New Bedford Cable Access TV in bringing you this interview was not to glorify war, but rather keep the memory of these brave individuals alive as they experience these hellish events. We must remember the price of freedom and the sacrifice that these individuals have given for the people and the country that they love. Their courage serves as a role model for individuals of all ages that when confronted with stress and seemingly insurmountable problems, that we must face them boldly and with courage. Finally, we hope to demonstrate that in this small corner of the nation, we are filled with individuals who have behaved heroically and have contributed significantly to the history and the well-being of our nation. We want to thank you for watching Heroes Among Us.